time I travel along the sinful road, beneath the heavy burden winding old. But now all things are different, for Jesus took my load. It's all right now. It's all right now. I'm His, I know. It's all right now. It's all right now, for I am in my Savior's care. It's all right now. It's all right now, my Savior hears and answers prayer. He'll walk with me. He'll walk beside me till I climb the heavenly stairs. And everything, and everything is all right now. pathway without a friend to guide. I walked in sin and sorrow all alone, till Jesus came and found me and drew me to his side. It's all right now. It's all right now, for I'm his own. It's all right now. It's all right now, for I am my Savior's care. It's all right now. It's all right now. My Savior hears and answers prayer. He'll walk with me. He'll walk beside me till I climb the heavenly stairs. And everything, and everything is all right now. my feet on higher ground. Each day my nights I'm gaining, my soul is nearing home. It's all right now. It's all right now. I'm heaven bound. It's all right now. It's all right now, for I am in my Savior's care. It's all right now. It's all right now. My Savior hears and answers prayer. He'll walk with me, he'll walk beside me, till I climb the heavenly stairs, and everything, and everything is all right now. I hadn't walked in six weeks till Wednesday, and I had my Wednesday night sermon almost together, so... Uh, I said, I'm going to go walk this morning. Uh, that's the first time I had to try it out. So I made it pretty well. But one thing that I was struggling with, I couldn't get a thought for this morning. I said, dear God, why can't I get a thought, you know? I need a thought for Scripture. And so uh, I just couldn't get it. But anyway, before the walk was over, I got this Sunday morning and next Sunday morning too. It's amazing. God give me two of them. So what it was, when I began to think about this, and uh, he said, I want you to talk about hail, fact, or fiction. Next Sunday, he wants me to talk about heaven, fact, or fiction. I said, okay, I'll do it. So we're going to do that, and uh, Brother Donnie is going to come. I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to read the scripture. Donnie's going to read it and turn to... Uh, the book of Luke, chapter 16, if you want to, it's on the screen. Uh, 16, 9 through, what is it, Donnie? 31. 31. All right, Brother Donnie. Thank you. I was reading this, and I, and I know I like that it's on the red because it's in the red in my Bible. Jesus said every one of these words. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that there was a, that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, 
for I am tor tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receives thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Amen. 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 Thank you, Donnie. Father, the subject is not very well, very much preached on today in our generation. I grew up hearing that message quite often. However, it's still very relevant. And, Father, it needs to be preached. And, Father, thank you for this morning for the opportunity to do it. I do it with a heart of compassion. I do it with a heart of love. But I believe in this place. It is real. And, Father, I pray you speak to our hearts here this morning. Her chance they could be one here that's maybe not a Christian. Lord, I pray that you open the eyes of their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Hail, fact or fiction? Uh, when we look at the passage of Scripture, we, we know there's a lot of debate today about that, about hell. Some says it's just a myth. Some say it's not real. It's not a real place. So we don't have to worry about it. That is the message of the atheist. They don't believe in this place called hell, so therefore they just forget about it. But fact or fiction? Now, uh, I want us to... Uh, I'm going to lose Luke 16. I'm going to kind of just briefly go over that. But uh, I'm going to uh, uh, kind of just... Scan through it, first of all. Now, when you look at hell of fact or fiction, when you, fiction, when you look at this, first of all, the, the, the question is that I'm putting before you, is it a fact or is it a fiction? Now, you're going to have to make a decision. I'll have to make a decision. We all have to make a decision. Uh, but here, when this passage of Scripture, uh, the unbelieving world, the liberals out there, these liberal professors and preachers, they say that this is a parable. Uh, but I, 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 I disagree with that because Jesus spake by parables many times. He spake by parables. A parable is a truth, a truth, a story best illustrating a truth. But this is not a parable. Because when you read parables, you will never find J Jesus mentioning names, right? In this passage of Scripture, there are names mentioned. There are people. And so we've got a rich man. We've got Lazarus. We don't know the rich man's name, but we've got rich man. We've got Lazarus, and we've got Abraham, and we've got Moses. All those names Jesus talked about. So this is coming from the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's not a parable. Now, he talked about uh, uh, the rich man, and you know the whole story. I'm not going to go through all of that. You know, how uh, the poor Lazarus was just a beggar, and the rich man had everything, wouldn't, wouldn't even give him a meal, and the dogs came and licked his sores, but the rich man died, and the angels took him into Abraham's bosom and all that. Now, and then the rich man died, and in hell he lifted up his eyes. It's a real place. It is a real place. He lifted up his eyes, or been in torments, plural, and there's a lot of torments there. I, I, I know, he said, I want one drop of water to cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. And so, uh, he, and, and Abraham said, no, there's no way you can get from where you're at, you can't get to where we're at. There's a great gulf fix, it's, there's no way you can get over here. So it's total separation. And so, you can't do it. And so then he said, well, I've got five brothers back on the earth, and no doubt they're lost too, but 
would you send Lazarus back and let Lazarus go to them and tell them that I said, don't come to this place, right? He didn't even want his brothers there. I heard the other day about this lady. She was some celebrity. She said, oh, I'm looking forward to dying and going to hell. I want to go there with my friends and have a good time. We're going to have a party down there. <laughs> Boy, that's a long, isn't that so foolish to have that kind of mindset? But that's what she said. And so this is the way our culture thinks to a great degree. Now, so the rich man said, I'm tormenting this flame. I don't want my brothers to come. But Abraham said, there's no way that this Lazarus can go back. And said, besides that, you know, they've got Moses and they've got the prophets. And if they won't hear Moses and they won't hear the prophets, they wouldn't hear Lazarus if he went back, right? They, they're not going to hear him. And so that's the story. Now, a fact is defined as something that is con uh, consistent with unbiased reality that can be proven with evidence. Now, let me ask you this. Many of you have been saved for a long time, correct? Anybody here been saved for 60 years? Uh, okay, a few. Anybody 50 years? How in the world? 40, 30, whatever. H how could you have stayed in church and loved God that long if there wasn't a Holy Spirit to help you along the way? H how can, uh, 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 and, and I've had drug addicts re that have been saved in my church and alcoholics. I've seen them saved. And, and, and how could they be delivered if it wasn't for God? Amen. That's evidence, right? Amen. It's evidence. Right here's evidence this morning. That's a fact. You're here. And you're here because you want to be here. And you're here because you once was lost, but now you're saved. God did something in your life. And you and I are an extension of the ministry of Christ. So because we have the Holy Spirit. Now, that, that, that is the fact. Okay, what's a myth? Fiction. It is defined as a deliberate false or unlikely uh, account. So would you say that this passage of Scripture is a fact? You have no question about that, right? No debates about it. Okay. Well, it is debated a lot, but I, we don't debate that. So we know that it's a truth. It's fic it, it is not fiction. It is the truth. Now, I read this guy, 10 Reasons Why I Don't Believe in Hell, with John Wright. is a documentary filmmaker. Don't even know who he was, but he's some kind of document. And I read the 10 ways he said he didn't believe in hell, and I said, that's the most foolish things I ever heard of. Ten reasons he didn't believe in hell and didn't make much sense to me. And so there's all kinds of these people, you know. And then uh, I, uh, the Mormon, I mean the um, Jehovah Witness, did you know they don't believe in hell? Are you aware of that? They get out on Saturday and give the little pamphlets out. Here, back in the, summer, back in the spring sometime, I'm, I'm, I think I was finishing my walk, and I started to get in my car, and here comes this car whooping in beside of me, pulled out, and this guy got out with a piece of paper and said, Hey, how you doing? I said, I'm doing fine. He's like, Can I give you this? I said, What is it? And I looked at it, and it was a Jehovah Witness and giving me the watchtower. I said, No, thank you. I'm saved. I'm a Baptist. I don't need your watchtower. But ain't that something? Just saw me walk and pull in and gave me a watch. They, they do that, and that's their works. But see what they believe, that when they die, you go into the grave, and that part is hell, and there is annihilation. What God does after a period of time, he annihilates that body, and there's no hell, right? That's not right, is it? That's wrong. But that's what they believe. And uh, universal... Uh, uh, Unitarians, you know, they don't believe in any hell. They don't believe in that. Richard Dawkins, a noted atheist, he doesn't believe in hell. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, a a physicist, he don't believe in hell. A and Stephen Hawkins, who just died recently, the smartest man in the world, sat in a wheelchair, he didn't believe in hell. He said, you know, I heard him, he, uh, one of the quotes he said was this. said, well, you ca we can't prove that God does not exist but, sa but science has made him unnecessary. Lord have mercy. So science was his God, right? I bet he's changed his tune now, don't you? God is necessary. So 
And I, I grouped this, all these up in one sentence. I grouped all of those people up in one sentence. And here it is. I don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. Right? Amen. Ain't that the problem in our culture? <laughs> they, they, they debated. <laughs> and these apologists, we got some great apologists that debates the atheists, and the atheists always lose. But, you know, the thing of it is, they do not believe this Bible is divinely inspired, and we do. And the reason that we do is because we got the Holy Spirit with us. Amen. The Holy Spirit it's amazing to me how that, that I can be walking, and, and I, I've never heard the voice of God. No, God's never talked to me. But I'm walking, and the Holy Spirit impresses me. Amen. Now, that's the Holy Spirit does that. But I believe this Bible to be the Word of Almighty God. Now, that brings me to hell. A real Is it a real place? Okay. Well, we believe that. Okay. The word hell. Let me give you a little statistics here. I'm, I'm very... Strong in them. Here, the word hell is mentioned 31 times in the Old Testament. You'll find it 31 times in the Old Testament. So the Old Testament spoke of hell, right? Well, how many times is it spoken in the New Testament? 23 times. 23 times in the New Testament it's spoken of. Well, how many times did Jesus speak of it in, in the four Gospels? He spoke of it 15 times in the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus spoke of it 15 times. And hell is mentioned 15 times in the Gospel, and Jesus is the only one that mentions it. Jesus is the only one that mentions hell in the New Testament. I'm sorry, in the four Gospels, I'm sorry. Now, when we go a little further, I did a little more research. Hell is mentioned two times in the book of Acts, just twice. And it's mentioned one time in the book of James. And it's mentioned one time in the book of 2 Peter. And it's mentioned four times in the book of Revelation. Jesus mentioned it more time than all the rest of the other writers of the New Testament, right? Amen. So I would say it's a real place, wouldn't you? So let's get that settled. It's a real place. Regardless of what all these other people say, they're not going to change our minds. They're not going to. So thank God for that. Well, was it created by God? That's another question I want to ask. Did God create hell? Well, I want to know, and I put this question before you. If God did create hell, and we believe he did, then what was his purpose for creating hell? Absolutely. You Bible readers know exactly what I'm talking about. That's the purpose of it. So he, he created it, and, and the purpose was in Matthew 25, 41. 25, 41. Now, when you read the preceding verses, you go in and read those preceding verses of that chapter, you will find that there was be the angels, and he talks about the second coming, talks about him sending his angels, separating the sheep from the goat, which is the sinners from the lost. And that's what he's talking about. So there'll be a time when the angels will come and separate us, the sheep will be on the right hand, and the, and, and, and the sinners will be on the left hand, correct? Okay, so then uh, uh, there will be, uh, uh, we did this, uh, you did this, you didn't do this, you did do this, you didn't do that. When do we see these, these, these do these things? Inasmuch as you did it not unto me, you did it unto the, uh, the others. If you did it not to them, you did it unto me. And if you did it unto them, you did it unto me, Jesus said. I'm just paraphrasing all that. And then... And then we will say, hypothetically, we Christians say, well, Lord, we didn't see you sick. We didn't see you in prison. We didn't see you hungry. But inasmuch as you did it unto the one of the least of these, my brother, who would you do it unto? Jesus. See what I'm saying? And then he says, then he may also say to them, on the left hand, the sinners is on the left hand, depart from me, you curse it, into everlasting fire, prepared created for the devil and his angels. So that's the purpose of hell. It was created. Now we know, uh, in my personal opinion, I think it's in the heart of the earth. This hell is. I believe it's in the heart of the earth. You say, why? What, what comes out of the, what's in a volcano? Fire is in a volcano. And so we don't, I don't know the dimensions of, 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 of uh, the earth, I, I, but God created it. He created this place, and there's 
fire there, and when you die, you go to hell lost, correct? So it was prepared for the devil as angels, but then the sinners that reject Christ, they go there too. That's a sad picture, but that's just the way where it is. It's a choice. It's a choice to go there. So hell was created by God. No question about that. Okay. Is hell forever? Well, now, wait a minute. The Catholics say, no, no, there's purgatory. It's not forever. There's a heaven. There's a purgatory. No, earth. I'm sorry. There's heaven. There's um, earth. There's purgatory. And there's hell. You believe that? It's not, not in the scriptures. Sounds good, right? I wish there was. Because here's the thing about that. If there was a purgatory, see, what, what they're saying is, if you happen to get out and get drunk or something, and you die while you're drunk, and even though you're a Catholic, you know you'll go to purgatory, and you'll have to spend some time there to pay for your drunkenness, and then after a period of time, you get out and go to heaven, right? That sounds good, right? That'd be good if you were to mess up and all at once we sin and we do something wrong and we didn't get forgiveness over it. Then we just go, well, I got purgatory. And you know they die believing that. Amen. They die believing that. Oh, my goodness, how deceptive that is. And so that is fiction, right? Amen. That is nothing but fiction. Now, I think I got some scripture here on that. I want you to look at, yeah, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9. Inflaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. That's vengeance belongs to who? God. Vengeance belongs to him. And so taking vengeance on them that know not God, and they that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So people that won't listen to me preach or any Drew preach or any other preacher that rejects the gospel, then what's going to happen to them? The wrath of God, vengeance on them. It's, it's terrible to reject the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting. That means hell's forever, right? So it's, it's a fact that hell is forever. There is no purgatory. There is no uh, mediator time, med uh, mediator. There's no one to mediate between that. When you die, you die lost. And you're for everlasting. That's why it's everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. You know, and that's the one thing that I've pointed this out time and time again. Y'all remember this. And, I, and, and hey, I, 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 I preach repetition. Let me tell you. So you might say, well, he's got dementia. He repeats all the time those things. No, I ain't got dementia. Thank God I hope I never get it. I just preach by repetition. Repetition. We, sometimes we don't always get it. It takes a long time before I get it, you know. <laughs> a long time. So repetition. Okay, here's the thing about it. What did Jesus say when he, when he was on the cross? My God? My God? Why? What's the reason you've forsaken me? Presence of God. Gone, gone. No God nowhere around. Never had. He experienced that before in his life when he was in heaven. He had never experienced God's presence not being with him, Right? And when he was down here on this earth, there had never been a moment in his life that God had ever left him. He was always there. But now he's gone. And he felt, a puny, he felt something he had never felt before in his life. Away from God. And the agony was excruciating. And I go back to that time he prayed in the garden. Let's go back and tie this in the end. You remember when he was praying in the garden, my Lord... If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. If not, not my will, your will be done. Amen. Could that be what he was praying so far? Could he so, looked in the cup and knew that God was going to have to turn his back on him? See, God turned his back on his son, and he felt something he had never felt before. And that's the way people are in hell right now. See, God is all around here. I see God everywhere. God is filling this world. And people that's lost, they don't recognize it like me and you do. But boy, let, let me tell you one thing. When they die and go into hell, there is no God. And it's going to be the, the most horrible place you've ever been in your life to be where God is not at. 
But glory to God, thus who are born again, saved by grace, got our name written indelibly in the Lamb's Book of Life. We're going to pray in the presence of God forever and ever and ever. Amen. Wow. Isn't that wonderful? The presence of the Lord made him pray that prayer. My God, my God, I stop forsaken. See, God forsakes you the very moment your heart stops, you breathe that last breath, and you die, sinner, it's over with. God's gone. Nothing can ever happen. It is forever. Revelation chapter 20, verse number 10. The devil said, or the Bible says the devil's cast into the lake of fire. False prophets will be there. And what will? They will be punished forever and ever and ever. Hell is forever. Fact. Fact. Not a fiction. Fact. Okay? Now, that's the third one. What's the fourth one? The fourth one is, why is hell enlarging itself? That was interesting to me. That was really interesting to me until I went into Isaiah, I mean, yeah, Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 13 through 11. But if you read, if you read the verses before that, like 11 and 12, and I don't have them on the screen, but, it, but let me read these first, and then I'll go back to 11 and 12. It says, therefore. Now, the word therefore means for this reason. Okay, for this reason, and that means you go back to 11 and 12 to really read that. My people are gone in captivity. Now, he's talking about the Jews. Isaiah's talking about the Jews this time. Because they have no knowledge of their honorable men and famished, uh, hungry, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore, therefore, as a result of that, when you go back to chapter 11, verse number 12, they were drinking alcohol and getting stuck drunk all the time. When you look at verse number 11 and verse number 12, these, Jew, these Hebrews were drinking wine and getting drunk all the time, living it up, having a party, and doing quite well, forgetting about God and all that. Or oh, it, was, it was what we thought they were doing in 11 and 12. And then you come here 13, and then in verse 14, as a result of the way they were living. I, 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 we're building breweries all over this county, right? Somebody drinking around here. There's all kinds of alcohol being consumed around here, right? I mean, you know, we're just doing this, we're doing that. I mean, it's a shame. And, and, and I, when I was moved to, Rob, uh, to Spruce Pine, North Carolina in 1983, that was a dry county. That was a dry county. You couldn't buy beer, you couldn't buy nothing up there. It was totally dry. And it wasn't too long till all the influx of different people come in there and they overtook the, uh, they got elected on, uh, on the city council and all that in the city and they voted in now. We've got wine, we got beer, we got liquor, we got it all up there now. So that's what's happened, see. And that's exactly what was going on here. And it's going on. They're having parties and people are dying, drunk and all that. And yet, God says, hell has to enlarge itself because of the party and, and all the drinking and all the stuff that was going on in the days of Israel. You can read it there, and you'll find that God said, and he made hell larger to accommodate. Why, why do you build something larger? If you've got a church that's full, know where to put them, you build it larger, right? Amen. To accommodate people. Hell is being filled up today, and it's filled up because of the way this world is nothing but having a party. They absolutely could care less about God. They're not interested about God. It's the hardest time I have ever seen. I've won people to the Lord many, few, several years ago. It's easy to win people to the Lord. They don't want you to even talk to them about it anymore. They're not interested in hearing what you've got to say. But it's terrible. But it's happening. What can we do? Pray for them. That's all we can do. That's all we can do. But hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. And their glory and their multitude and their prop and their he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. Well, you and I know the Bible teaches that the, how many people, are there more people going to heaven than hell? No, it doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that more people going to hell than they go to heaven. Because broad is the road that leads to destruction. Leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to heaven. Few there be that find it. So, it is, has enlarged itself. Will there be degrees of punishment in hell? That's interesting to me. Do you believe that? Fact, fiction. Do you believe 
that that will be degrees of punishment in hell. Amen. Yes, sir. I got scripture for that. Matthew chapter 11, verse 20 to 24. Then began he to upbraid. To When you look at the word upbraid, that means he, he, he just um, criticized them and uh, rebuked them, the cities, where most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. He raised the sick, healed, uh, raised the dead, healed the sick, gave sight to the blind, all that stuff. A lot of that went on in these cities. And then he says, verse 21, Woe, woe unto thee, Chorazin, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. And then he says, For if the mighty works, if the works that had been done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, the other two cities on the north coast, over on the, which should be on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, out of out of Israel. If they, if these mighty works had been done in these two cities, they would have repented long ago, in sackcloth and ashes. And you've seen all of this stuff, and you haven't even repented. You've seen what I've done, and you haven't repented. Verse 22, but I say unto you, he's going back to these cities now, it shall be more tolerable. It's going to be more tolerable. You're going to be, there's punishment, more punishment for you. More tolerable, I mean more, uh, more tolerable for Tyre and Sodom at the day of judgment than for you. They're, uh, let me rephrase that. They're going, to ta they're going to fire better than you all have. Yeah, because they didn't have these. They're going to be able to tolerate. They're going to be able to tolerate some of the judgment. But you're not going to be able to tolerate it because they didn't see what you have seen. They didn't experience what you have seen. Right? Okay. They're going to do better in the day of judgment than you're going to do. So there's punishment. There is degrees of punishment. So when you are required more, if, you're, if you see anything like that, then why didn't they believe? I don't know why they didn't believe. I remember it. They didn't. And then he goes to Capernaum. He says, Thou Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven. They had an exalt problem. They had an ego problem. Shall be brought down to hell. Capernaum. And Jesus spent a lot of time in Capernaum there at the Sea of Galilee. I've been in that town many times. And so they're going to be brought down to hell. Now, he said, for if the mighty works which had been done in thee, same thing, dead raised, sick healed, feeding the 5,000, all these miracles that I have done here at Capernaum. He says, which would have been done in thee, had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah. That's same, I'm, I'm adding Gomorrah, but that's what it is. If these things had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, what did it say? It would what? You mean to tell me if those things had been done, does Jesus know what he's talking about here? Are you telling me that he would have, if that had been done down in Sodom, all these miracles that he'd done down there, that they could, that city would not have been destroyed? Well, that's what he says. I can't figure that out. I mean, he knows, he's omniscient. He, w he knew that if he had done that in Sodom, these miracles down there, they would have repented and got right. Right? Okay. Said he would have been spared. I wouldn't have destroyed it. And he destroyed it because of homosexuality. Lesbians, that's why he destroyed the city. But if it had been done down there, these miracles, no doubt they would have believed and would have turned to God. Wow. But I say unto you that it will be more tolerable for the land that will be able to fare better in the judgment than you're going to fare. So you can't tell me there's not punishments in hell. You can't tell me that. 
And let me drop something on you right here. This, this really, this is true. You might not agree with me, but I flat believe this with all my heart. This is the Bible Belt of the world. We're in the Bible Belt of the world. And I believe that, and I've told you this just a couple Sundays ago, that guy in the Amazon never heard a message, but God reveals himself in Romans chapter 8, I mean chapter 1, verse 18 through 20 through there. God reveals himself to every human on this planet. Even though there's no, we got missionaries there in Amazon, so, but they prob, there are probably some of that's never heard a message, a missionary. But you can't tell me that that man that's never heard a message, when he dies, that he goes to heaven without being saved. Absolutely not. You, the Bible says you must be born again. So you say, well, it's not fair for God to send him to hell because he's never heard the gospel. God reveals himself in them, in their spirit, through the creation that God has created. It teaches that in Romans chapter 1. Verse 18, God reveals himself to every human being on this planet in their spirit that he is God and that they're going to have to make a choice of whether they're going to believe him or reject him. That's in the word of God. Now, but what about these people that sit in Blount County every uh, Sunday and for years have heard the gospel of Christ? And heard preaching on radio, on television, on the streets. I remember when they used to have street preachers. Y'all remember them? Up on Merville? And you tell me that God would punish that person in Amazon more than he would punish a person here that hears all this gospel and rejects it. No, sir. No, sir. When you reject the Word of God consistently, and it's been preached all over this county for years. And people have rejected and rejected it. They will be punished in more severely than that guy in the Amazon. And the least, the least punishment is more unbearable. It's unbelievable just being there. But there will be the punishments in hell to the degree of rejecting God or His Word. Now, you might not believe that, but I'm totally convinced that that's exactly what he's trying to teach us right here. So it's important that people say, well, you know, I'm, I, I, and we reject the gospel, reject the gospel, reject the gospel. You can't tell me that that person ain't going to be punished way more than the person that never heard the gospel. Going to be punished. Terrible. I believe that. Now, Conclusion. Hail. A fact or fiction? All these five things I've talked about. Hell is a real place. Is that a fact? Amen. Okay. Uh, it was created by God. Fact. Uh, it, um, why is hell enlarging itself? Because more people are going there. Fact. Will there be degrees of punishment in hell? A fact. Now, what is your belief about hell? What do you believe? Do you agree with the biblical view of hell? Amen. You don't put in question marks where God puts a period, huh? No. Okay. Or you to believe as Richard Dawkins, Stephen Hawkins, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Jehovah Witness, and the Unitarian Church who says there is no God, you don't agree with that crowd, do you? No. We don't agree with that crowd. Because they're as lost as they can be. Now, sermon that was preached in 14, I'm 1741 by the name of Jonathan Edwards. He lived in Connecticut, went to Massachusetts, to this Bible conference, wasn't even, wasn't even scheduled to preach. The preacher didn't show up, so they got Jonathan Edwards to preach. He hadn't studied, so he read from his scripture. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, he read from that, his notes, looked down at it, and read it word for word. 
sinners in the hands of an angry God. Anybody ever heard of Jonathan Edwards? You know how many people got saved? 500 people got saved. They say that when he preached that sermon, they held on to the back of the pews and gripped them because they were trembling because it was so real. Today, they can listen to a message and go out and it never bothers them on hell. It doesn't bother our people. They become gospel hardened. They just come gospel hardened. Isn't that sad? That's where we're at. Now, what can we do about it? Well, well we can't make them. But tell them it's a fact. It's a fact. Now, we're going to sing, and we're going to give an invitation. I'd say most of us are saved. It could be somebody here's not. I don't know. But if you are saved, that's wonderful. If you're not, you can be. You can be. So if you ladies come on uh, to the instruments, uh, you, you can be saved today. Yeah, he still saves. I'm going to ask you to stand. Bow your heads. Eternal Father. Wow. Well, I'm so glad this morning. I told you this morning, Father, as we had my, my, my private worship here, I'm so glad, God, you saved me. I'm so glad of that time in my life when you knocked at my heart's door through the Holy Spirit and revealed to me Hell, you did. Oh, I'm so glad for that. I'm so glad, Lord, you invited me into your kingdom and I accepted that invitation. And this morning, Lord, you are looking at every heart right now. You know whether we're saved or not. I don't know. I, I, I look around, I say most of us are. Maybe, maybe all of us are. I don't, I don't know. But, Father, we're going to do a little different this morning and I'm, I've been... I ask you to give me insight on how to deal with this invitation, and I'm going to follow you here in just a little bit. But if there's anyone here, God, that you have spoken to about their relationship with you, and they want to go to heaven, and they want to miss this place called hell, I pray right now, Father, they come to the altar, and I'll show them how. I can show them exactly how to escape this awful place. It's real, God. In Jesus' name, amen. One sixty one. Jesus is tenderly calling the home, calling to. sister, a loved one, a neighbor that you know is not saved. How many of us got those? I say most all of us got them. Okay. Maybe you've got maybe you've got a husband or a wife. How, how are we going to reach them? It seems like the gospel can't penetrate. So I said, okay, God, how are we going to get to these people? It's tough right now. It's the diff most difficult time I've ever seen trying to get people saved today. It's hard. But they can be. They can be. And here's what we're going to have to do. I'm going to tell you what you're going to have to do. 
you have to understand one thing. That the only way that that person that you love and that you know is lost. And I've got them. i got five I pray for right here. Two in this church and three outside this church. I pray for I know they're lost. Now, and the way you address that is you pray for the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of their hearts. They're not going to do anything about their lost condition. They're not going to quit their drinking. They're not going to quit this or whatever they do or don't do. They're not going to quit it until the Holy Spirit knocks at their heart's door. Correct? I didn't do nothing about mine until I got what? Convicted. Okay? And they're not going to do anything about, about their condition until the Holy Spirit knocks at their heart's door. Okay? Now, how are we going to do that? There ain't but one way to do that. And that's to pray for God to send the Holy Spirit into their hearts and convict them. Show them this place is real. Okay? Now I've got five men that I'm praying for right here. Now I'm going to get on my knees this morning. I'm going to pray for God. I want you to go to them. I want you to open the eyes of their hearts. I want you to knock at their heart's door. I want you to show them their lost condition. Now, if you want to join me for your loved one or your person, you come up here and you just pray. Let's spend our time praying. This is the conclusion of this service. This is what we're going to do. This is what God told me to do. You have them to pray for the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of their heart. They're blind. They can't see. They don't know. And we've got to come between them and hell. I want us to come between them and hell. And the only thing we can do is pray for them. And then if God sends a message to them through us, go to it. Go deliver it, right? I've had to do that a few times. So let's come. Let's bow in this altar. Fill it out. I pray for you. If you can't come to the altar, fill it out. And if you can pray where you at, just pray. But let's come here and pray for our people alone. We need to have God to do something special in our community, okay? All right.